So I want to welcome everybody to uh, our, our first ever virtual uh, chamber luncheon. And uh, I'm excited to have everybody uh, tuning in today. Uh, this is different for, for me. We have been doing a lot of virtual ribbon cuttings and we're getting used to this virtual space. Uh, but again, this is the first time that we've actually had a, a guest speaker join us to, to actually provide a, a, you know, their, their story uh, virtually as opposed to in person. So for anybody who, who follows our Chamber of Commerce, you know that we have one of the largest luncheon series in the state of Kentucky. Uh, we have a tremendous crowd on a monthly basis and uh, the coronavirus has put a little bit of a damper on that. But again, we're uh, reinventing the wheel a little bit. We're finding new ways to become uh, in innovative and creative. And, and today, uh, I wanted to uh, have a, our speaker from May uh, join us. So this is uh, retired Brigadier General Michael J. Bouchard. So uh, Mike Bouchard is someone that I've actually gotten to know through uh, the Mill Springs Battlefield Association. Uh, but I've had a chance to know him uh, a little bit also through the American Legion down here where he sits as the the president, I believe it's the president of the American Legion uh, post 38 chapter here in Somerset and uh, uh, just a tremendous uh, asset. We're lucky to have him. And I asked him several months ago if he would join us and just tell us his story. Now, I know with Memorial Day coming up, that is obviously uh, of great uh, importance to uh, everybody, including yourself, Mike. And, and uh, I know that you had some personal stories and things that you wanted to talk about today, maybe service uh, with this new generation of soldiers that are out there. But I want to read uh, Mike's bio first and foremost. So retired Brigadier General Michael J. Bouchard had 22 different assignments that included five deployments, peacetime and combat, and commanded at all levels up to brigade in his almost 31 years in the Army. He started his career as a Cold War warrior, protecting the U.S. and our European allies from a Soviet Union attack across the Fulda Gap, and ended his career in a global war on terror, war planning and conducting counterinsurgency operations. On September 11th, 2001, when American Airline Flight 77 was hijacked and deliberately crashed into the Pentagon, Michael was at a meeting that morning on the first floor of the Pentagon, just around the corner from where the plane crashed. That day, he assisted with saving the life of his executive officer, who was badly injured and burned in the attack. General Bouchard says, for me, 9-11 changed my life forever. He began his career in 1985 as an engineer officer, and he has been assigned with every type of engineer unit in the Army has in its inventory. The last third of his career, he was predominantly an operational and strategic planner and leader. During his last deployment to Afghanistan, he was one of the planners of the surge that embedded U.S. and coalition forces with Afghan National Police Units in the 365 Afghan districts. And he assisted the Afghan Parliamentary Forces with their deployment and support of combat operations in Kandahar and Helmand provinces, assisting British, Canadian, and US Marine Corps forces fight against the Taliban. He's married to Dr. Tracy Bouchard, who is a pediatrician at Nationwide Children's Hospital. They have nine children and four grandchildren and spend most of their time traveling around the country to visit them and traveling to Germany to visit family there. His hobbies include riding bikes, motorcycles, and hiking. He is also a passionate supporter of veterans and is currently the commander, commander, of the American Legion Post 38 in Somerset. He's also a board member of the Mill Springs Battlefield Association and a volunteer of the local Veterans Administration Clinics. Uh, Mike, it's great to have you with us today. Well, Bobby, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I actually wish we were there having a, 
lunch because I'm actually hungry right now. I haven't eaten. <laughs> yeah. Well, likewise. You guys, you guys put on a good spread. I know every time I went there, you guys had a, a great meal, a lot of good fellowship and, uh, and friendly people out there in the crowd. And I feel bad that, that, that we can't meet in person, but I know that's going to happen again very soon. I think the great thing is being Americans today, because as Americans, we are adaptive type of people. And this is a prime example here. You know, we can't meet in person, so what do we do? We're using technology, and isn't technology great? I mean, there's good and bad to everything, but I'll tell you, this technology stuff is awesome. I, uh, you know, I think about, uh, look at the kids today. I've got a couple kids in college who aren't able to meet in their classrooms because of the COVID uh, pandemic, and, uh, and they're meeting online. They're still doing their work online. And uh, I'll tell you, when, when I went to college in the uh, early 80s, there was no such thing as computers. You know, the computers we had were like Fortran computers. You had to come up with these cards, you punch your cards in, you put the code, and you run it. The, the most uh, advanced thing that I own was my calculator. I had an HP calculator. I was an engineer uh, student at the time. So I had the, you know, one of those awesome HP calculators. And I look at my phone that I have today, these phones here does more than that calculator could have ever done. You know? This is the, the, uh, the level of technology in, in these devices. And, and for us to be able to meet and do this, this is a great thing. I know it's not as, Good as being in person, but it, it's still good we could do this. A little bit awkward, but I think we'll get through it. You know, there is a couple things that I wanted to talk to everyone about. And first of all, the thing I really want to hit before I start talking us a couple other subjects is Memorial Day. This is May. May of every year, we celebrate Memorial Day on the last Monday of the month. And for me, I could tell you Memorial Day. Is, is an important holiday every day. Uh, it isn't just a once in a year time event for somebody like me. And I think that's because of my experience in the military and what I've experienced in those 31 years. Uh, I've lost friends, I've lost uh, 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 subordinates who worked for me, and I've lost um, some of my uh, alumni friends from, from the uh, university that I attended. So Memorial Day is something that, that I cherish and I think of every day. And every opportunity I get, I try to stress the importance of everybody in our nation to at least that one day a year to really think about how fortunate and blessed we are as a country. And I think the reason why we are fortunate and blessed or a good part of that reason is because of the, the men and women who in the history of this country who have raised their right hand to defend and support the Constitution of the United States and to defend its citizens and defend our way of life. So I just wanna emphasize, just because there's COVID, we got the pandemic right now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't still take the opportunity and the time to celebrate Memorial Day towards the end of this month. And I encourage everyone to please do that. I can tell you on Memorial Day, the things that I think of, I'm a history buff, um, kind of had to uh, be, being in the military. But, uh, you know, what I think about Memorial Day is how our nation was formed. And if you think about the Revolutionary War, the first person that is documented to have given his life for this country, although we were not a country yet, but we were well on the way of, of on, on that route to becoming our own country. That first person's name was Crispus Attucks. It was in the Boston Massacre. The first person killed wanted freedom in our country. And the great thing about Crispus Attucks is he was a freed slave up in Boston at the time. And, uh, and then you think just a couple years later, Lexington and Concord were on Lexington Green, we lost eight more men on that day. And then later on in that day, at the bridge in uh, Lexington, where the shot heard around the world, as it was called, started our route 
to us becoming our own country and freedom away from the crown of uh, England at the time. So that's what I think about Memorial Day. Also think about all the soldiers throughout our history who have given their lives to our country. You know, some people kind of mix Memorial Day and Veterans Day up. Memorial Day is to honor those who have given their lives in service to our country. Veterans Day is to honor those who are serving our country and those who have served in the past and those still serving today. So, you know, I ask everyone, please think about those who have given their lives for our country Memorial Day. Since the form of our country, there's been 1.2 million Americans, both men and women, that have given their lives to do our freedom. And I want everyone to cherish that. You know, since uh, being a resident of uh, Kentucky and living in Somerset, I did a lot of research, especially on Pulaski County, plus being the commander of Post 38. And I wanted to know how many soldiers or how many citizens of Pulaski County have given their lives in, in, in the nation's wars. We were able, able to go back to World War I. There's not a lot of good records from prior to World War I. But from World War I up to current today's date, there's been 260 Pulaski County citizens or residents who have given their lives in service to their nation and country. 260 since World War I. I can tell you from the research I've done, the first person to give their life in World War I from Pulaski County was a private. His name was uh, John Humble. And I need to put my glasses on to read this, but his name was John C. Humble, a private. He died on 16 July, 1918. He was part of the 3rd Infantry Regiment, or the 3rd Infantry Division, 7th Infantry Regiment. He is buried today in France at an American uh, cemetery in France. You look at his life, he was 20 years old. He was a private. He probably volunteered to go overseas to fight in this war and left Pulaski County. Now the last individual to give their life from Pulaski County, and I bet a lot of people in Pulaski County probably don't even realize this, we have lost one person in the global war on terrorism. And that was in 2004. And that individual's name, he was actually a specialist. So that's an E4. He was specialist Joshua Titcomb. And he died on 29 September 2004. And he was part of the 2nd Infantry Division, 72nd Armored Regiment. And he died when his tank hit an explosive device and he died inside his tank. Now, the similarities between Joshua Titcomb and John Humble, or, or John, yeah, John Humble and Joshua Titcomb, there's similarities between the two. Both of them were 20 years old. They were both from Pulaski County. On the case of Joshua Titcomb, he was not born and raised in Pulaski, but he was actually from Hawaii. But he came to Somerset, Kentucky, and he lived there for a couple of years working. I think he had friends there or family members, and then he joined the army from Somerset, Kentucky. And that's why his, his name is uh, attributed to Pulaski County. So that's 260 men. All of them are men. Um, and I think that's something as a community we should always remember, you know. We should always think about men like them. And the majority of them were young Boys, I consider them. 20 years old is not very old, you know. They're just starting their lives. They never really had an opportunity to have families. They never had an opportunity to have true loves, get married and have kids. And, uh, and I, I think uh, for one day a year, we, we should really set aside and really think about this and be uh, as grateful uh, as, as possible. I don't think that's a lot being asked for this one day a year. Now, a couple other things I wanted to talk about. Um, I want to talk about when I joined the Army, and I want to try to talk to the audience a little bit, because I know the audience are business 
leaders in the community and owners. And I wanted to tell them a little bit about my experience when I joined the Army. You know, when I was a kid, I always knew I was going to go in the Army. I just had this passion about the Army. And I can't tell you why. Uh, part of my life, I grew up in Germany. My mother's German. And I can remember spending my, my summers at my grandmother's house. And every once in a while, there'd be these tanks rolling down the road real early in the morning. And the house would be rumbling. I'd run to the window. I was on the second story, and I'd look down out of the window, and the tanks be rolling by in the street, and I'd wave. Uh, tank commanders would normally have their heads sticking out of the hatches of the tank, and they would wave back. And I always thought, man, I want to be just like that person, just like that, that guy in that tank. So I always knew as a little kid I was going to join the Army someday. I can remember being in high school. I did pretty well. I, I did well academically. Uh, um, I, I did well, you know, I, I was very fortunate. I, I was athletic also. I did well in, in, in athletics. And, uh, and, and I got the opportunity to go to a, a military school, in a, a, a military college and uh, academy. And um, I remember telling my teachers that, I was accepted and that I was gonna go and become an officer in the United States Army. And I remember my teachers not really being enthusiastic and happy about it. And they would question what my motivation was. And almost as, and they were telling me that I wasn't living up to my potential. And I always thought how odd that was that they were putting down somebody who wanted to go into the military and serve their country. And I always kept that in the back of my head. And was I living up to my potential? Well, I went, I was a cadet for four years. After my four years, I got commissioned. I got commissioned 17 May, 1985. I still remember the day today. It was a special day for me. I was proud. I went to the military. I did my training, did some training down in uh, Virginia. Went on to Fort Benning, did some more training. Airborne School Ranger. And then on to uh, Germany, where I got assigned as a platoon leader in Germany. As a platoon leader, I was 22 years old. I was in charge of 40 men in an engineer platoon, four squads. At the time, we had an enemy, the Soviet Union. And, uh, and we had a general defense plan. So I knew exactly what my platoon had to do for the first three days of any war that we would potentially have with the Soviet Union. And back then, the potential was very high that there would be a war. And I knew exactly what I had to do for the first three days of that war. I had 20 targets that I was responsible for. And they always told me, this is what you need to do for 72 hours. And I always asked my commanders, well, what happens after 72 hours? And he said, you probably wouldn't be here. But hopefully the reinforcements would have made it over to Europe within that time. We were just there to slow the enemy down. Well, I remember being that platoon leader and then getting the opportunity to become an XO, an executive officer for bridging unit. 100, uh, 210 men in that unit, and, and I was the second in command of that unit. I did my time, I did my four years, always thinking in the back of my mind, am I living up to my potential? As my teacher said to me, my guidance counselor in high school. And I decided, you know, I'm gonna get out of the military I'm going to go home, and I'm going to live up to my t potential. I had an engineering degree. I want to go design bridges for a living and, and buildings as a structural guy. So I got out of the military. Got out of the military in 1989. I remember going back home. I was married at the time with one child, looking for a job. I finally found the job that I thought that I would love working for the Department of Transportation in the state of New Hampshire, designing and building bridges. Now, I remember going to the interview, being so excited, I had my resume, showing what I did, showing my leadership skills, showing, you know, I was 27 at the time. That, you know, I led 40 men whose lives and well-being were in my hands. I was in charge of millions of dollars of equipment. I had all these different projects I worked on and different missions. 
And I remember having that inter interview and the person in the interview really didn't care. They offered me a job, but it, it wasn't what I expected. I expected that my, although I had only been in the military for four years prior to that, that somehow that I could show them that I was ready to be a leader in their organization. They didn't see it that way. They saw it that I have to start at the bottom with everybody else. So I started as a bottom as a, I think it was a civil engineer one with kids directly out of college. That was a hard pill to swallow for me. What I used to think was, you know, yeah, people always say, uh, thank you for your service, but were they really thankful? You know, as somebody who would serve their nation, just got out looking for a job, thought I had a good resume, showed them what I've done leadership wise, and it didn't really matter in their eyes. And I started at the bottom. Well, I do what all good military people do. I suck it up and I drive on. So that's what I did. I just sucked it up and drove on, hoping that an opportunity would come and I'd be able to shine and get ahead like I wanted to do. I wanted to find my passion. Well, I did that for a couple years and things just didn't work for me. I kept thinking about the military. I told you I got out. I wasn't really out because about six or seven months later, I joined the National Guard. If you look at my resume, you see I was active duty, National Guard, then back in active duty. I joined the National Guard. It was fun again. I started loving being around and the camaraderie that we had with the, with the other men and women and the type of missions we, we performed. It was something that I enjoyed. So I joined the guard and I did that for a couple years and nothing was happening with my job at the time, my civilian job, where I started looking for opportunities to get back on active duty. And I found that opportunity and I went back on active duty. Now, why do I tell you that story? Because I think of our kids today, the kids who are joining our military today, and by the way, it's a 100% all volunteer force. Nobody is forced into anything. I think of the kids today, I think of the millennial generation and some of the bad reputation that they have. But I'll tell you the kids I serve with, and by the way, if you look at today's military, a little over 2 million, that is less than 0.8% of our population are serving today, less than 0.8. You know, if you look at World War II as an example, I want to give you some other statistics that I think are pretty incredible. In World War II, 11.2% of the population served in, a, in four years of a war, 11.2. Vietnam, 4.3% in a 12-year war. Global war and terrorism, 0.45% have served since 9-11. 0.45, less than half a percent. That's unbelievable if you think about that. It shows you that fewer and fewer people have shouldered more and more of the burden of this country as time has gone on. So these kids today, you have to be proud of them. You can't lump them in the same category as their peers, quote unquote, the millennial generation, because they are a step ahead. But what I noticed from talking with them, especially those that get out of the military, is that they feel they kind of had the same experience I had when they decided to go into the military. Most of their parents, they want to support them in that. Everyone's pushing college today. If you don't go to college somehow, you're not going to be successful. And you're not living up to your potential. The same thing I heard back in the late 70s, early 80s, exact same thing. Yet everyone says, thank you for your service to these kids. But do they really mean it? I don't know. I'd like to think that the majority of people do. You know, these kids come home, they feel that people don't understand them. A lot feel that they don't, people don't understand what they've sacrificed lost relationships that they've had. They've all joined the military knowing that they're gonna to go to war, knowing that there's conflict today. 
And they're the ones who have really sacrificed for this country. Them, their families, their parents, their spouses, if they're married, their children, and their loved ones. Nobody else in this country has been asked to sacrifice anything since September 11th. We don't have war bonds like we had in World War II. There's no gas rationing. And uh, nobody's taxes went up because of the war. So is any, is, are we really sacrificing today? I would say no. Right now we are because of this COVID crisis. But prior to that, the only one sacrificing was that, like I, told, like I said earlier, 0.7% of the population and their families and loved ones. So I want people to understand that. I want our leaders out there, our business leaders, to understand that and think about that. When you meet those veterans, when you meet those who get out of the military or the young kids that want to join the military, praise them. Continue to say thank you for their service, but really mean it. And I'll tell you, when these kids get out of the military, they're looking for something that they're passionate for. They've come out of an organization that is a values-based organization. They have tremendous potential, a lot of values. And I think as business leaders, you need to look at those intangibles that you can't really quantify, but look, look and talk to these kids. What they've done, the sacrifices they've made, the understanding, the global awareness they have. And really, uh, really have a deep conversation with them. Many of them are looking for, for, for their passion when they get out. They love being on teams. They love being loyal. They were in an organization that valued selflessness over self-interest. That's the type of kids that are getting out of the military today. And these kids are not looking for jobs, they're looking for careers. They're looking for career opportunities, not necessarily just a job. So I hope that the community out there understands that and keep that in the back of your mind whenever you meet a veteran, especially our young veterans out there who are really carrying a heavy load for this country. So with that, uh, you know, I want to thank you again. Uh, and um, like I told you before, Bobby, if you ever want me to, to talk some other time, I'm always willing to talk. I, I, there's so many subjects I could talk about, but I really want to emphasize this generation of warriors today because these kids are incredible. Uh, you can't call them the greatest generation because it's not the whole generation that's doing this. But those kids that are deciding that, you know, I want to go in the military, and try to do something, even if they're getting uh, resistance, you've got to respect them for that and uh, you, you got to appreciate them. So uh, with that, uh, I don't know if you have any questions or... Well, I will say this, um, I, I think it's a great message. Uh, thank you for your service. I do mean that truly coming from someone who came from a family of, uh, with a career military officer. I, I, I understand and I love you talking about those in, unintangible, you know, those, those uh, getting the business community to understand how important it is to hire, uh, you know, veterans and, and people from service. I think it's very important and hopefully uh, that message resonates from some of the people that, that hear this today. Uh, I want to thank you again for, for taking time out of your day to have this conversation with us, Mike. It, it means a lot. It's such a powerful message coming from someone of your stature. So uh, I really want to thank you. And, and, and again, uh, we, will, we, we appreciate your time so much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bobby. And uh, I'm hoping we could all get together in person here soon. <laughs> Absolutely. I call this Groundhog Day, and I could talk to you about Groundhog Day because I've experienced it uh, in my last deployment to uh, Afghanistan. Every day becomes a routine, the same thing, day after day, it seems like. And, uh, sure. But, uh, but I'm really proud of this country. I think we've done a good job, and, uh, and uh, I, I can't wait until we can see each other in person again. Well, again, thank you. And, and everybody who's listening and watching today, I want to thank you as well for uh, tuning in.
Uh, we're doing the best we can to reinvent the wheel here and really keep moving forward and ha you know, have one of the best chambers in the state. Uh, stay tuned for June. I think we're going to have uh, some more fun. We're supposed to be having a state of the city and county address with our mayor and judge. We're going to see if we're going to be able to do that in person or maybe we'll be doing this again. I'm not really sure. But again, thanks for tuning in. Mike, thanks again for your time as well. And, uh, and we appreciate you so much.